welcome. Good morning. We are so glad that you are here with us, and if you are joining us online, we are glad that you are taking the time to be part of our service today. Just a couple of housekeeping pieces. Uh, one for right now, we will uh, continue with in-person worship. Uh, however, we will be watching the indexes. Uh, the recommendation from the conference today was that we, or this week, was that we watch what's coming out uh, from DHHS and that if there's a change that we prayerfully look at, um, that we prayerfully look at and if there is a change that we will we will go accordingly. I will tell you that some churches have already switched and gone back um, to virtual, uh, but for now we are going to stay in person. Uh, we will keep again. We will keep watch on it to decide if we're going to switch back or not. Are there prayer requests that we have this morning? Yes, ma'am. Uh, Ron. My friend Ron Smith, he went to the hospital by ambulance last month. And Jason is wanting to come home. And I don't think I can do it. I don't think I can do it. Mr. Ms. Betty, we're glad to see you back there. Ms. Betty. We want the family. John Hunter said to send his regards and to thank you for your prayers and your thoughts. John retired uh, on Friday. Um, I am not sure who will be uh, handling one church, one child, but we will, uh, I'll let you know as soon as I get word uh, from him. Oh, my friend Mary Alice, yes. Matthew Degeneration, she's on the farm, but she had a cataract removed this week. And the doctor said it was so big it should have been removed two years ago. And she, at this point right now, cannot see anything out of her So she is gone completely now. So I want to ask the Lord to keep Ms. Angie, you have a, an announcement to share? Yeah. Um, you know, we normally go, we normally go to the kitchen and cook for Rowan Health and Ministries, but um, I know our population is not necessarily comfortable with doing that, but we still need to service the, um, the Rowan Health and Ministries as often as we can. And so um, we are going to do donations. I just I picked the thing they had. They actually wanted a list of things they needed were salt and pepper packets and then mayonnaise, ketchup, mustard, little packets. So if you are able to purchase those, um, um, feel free to bring those to church over the next three Sundays. Um, that's going to be kind of our theme for these next three. Um, if you just want to donate, then just you can give the money to me or Lisa Meisenheimer um, or Grace, Julie, and Sandy. And we'll go purchase them at Sands. Believe it or not, only a dollar ninety-eight will buy twelve hundred little salt packets. So um, it doesn't take a large donation to be able to for us to, to buy a lot of little small packets of things that they have requested. And then we'll switch it up in three weeks. Oh really? Okay. Well, okay, I'll look down there too then. Okay, let us pray. God of the lost and lonely, God of the secure and the confident, gather us into your fold that we may be healed and transformed. Bring your guiding light into our hearts and our spirits that we may see the opportunities that are available in our community to serve you. Help us. 
Help us to see that following your call to feed the hungry, bring nourishment to those who thirst, offer clothing to those in need, to visit the sick and those who are imprisoned, and to welcome a stranger. Any activity of service is an act of great privilege and an act of joy. Guide us in your world that we may be part of ministries in your world. And for we ask all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Please stand. Remember to show those around you that you love them. Then right. also remember, middle finger, palm, God loves you. Now Ms. Nancy's going to teach us to do 25 jump attacks. <laughs> Please be seated.
holiday. Things and plans will be a little different, I know. And for 2020, it will be difficult for some to find uh, anything to be thankful for. But try. Look and see. Because there are things that even though we've had to deal with the pandemic that we can be thankful for. There's been closer family time. There's been time for us to reflect and to, to, to take that time to read the word and to, to talk with God. So there are things there to be thankful for. And as you celebrate on Thursday, try to find a way to, to do it a little different. Um, we will be uh, it will just be Debbie and I and the kids and uh, my mom and all in Maryland will be eating at the same time, although we will have a computer there. So we will be together just 493.2 miles apart. Um, so try and find a way to, to find something to be thankful for. Also, next week we'll be beginning our season of Advent. A time when we look forward to the coming of God, to look forward to, to the change that it will bring for us. Um, if you have your bulletin with you this morning, please feel free to join with me in the prayer of confession. Merciful God, we get so caught up in our own lives and needs that we fail to see others that for whom we may provide some help and relief. You challenge us to feed those who are hungry, to quench the thirst of those who are parched. You ask us to bring clothing to those who have none for whom clothing is inadequate for the weather. To visit people who are sick, who are alone, who are alienated, who are imprisoned either in cells with bars or in conditions of hopelessness and poverty. That they see no way out. To welcome the stranger and to reach out to those who are marginalized to always bring your words of healing and redeeming love. We have failed in those tasks. We ignore the opportunities to claim that we are in claim that we are too busy to help, too busy to care. And how this attitude must sadden you, Lord. You lavish your gifts upon us that we may use them for the betterment of your realm and we treat them as inconveniences. Forgive us, O oh God. Forgive us and heal our wounds of greed and selfishness. And let us greet this day with the hope of the reign of Christ can be made manifest, and that we can be part of this glorious kingdom of peace and of passion, compassion. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Hear these words of assurance. In the name of Jesus Christ, who brings peace and hope to us, we are forgiven. We are healed and enabled to be part of the ministries of compassion in God's world. Rejoice. You are chosen and you are loved. Amen. This is when I think now we'll come forward with our children. Can you hear me okay? Well, wow. Um, you know, in preparing for this morning, I was thinking about the fact that, you know, we're going to be gathering together, it's almost a little bit differently this year, for Thanksgiving. We've been talking about gratitude. And so, I think sometimes it's easy for us to remember that it's easy to be grateful when things are going well. It's been a challenging year for a lot of different reasons. Um, you know, there are things that have not been pretty difficult in our country, in our communities, and then on top of that, a pandemic. It really caused us to 
time. Especially when we're ever going to get back to normal. If normal is even attainable at this point. I think sometimes it's easy for us to remember that no matter where we are and what we're doing, what is going on is that God, number one, is in control. And that no matter how challenging our times can be, we still need to be thankful. Thanksgiving this year will not look like we have been looked in the past. We may not gather with people that we really would love to gather with, but he is here. And he loves us. And we have many things to be thankful for. So on those tough days, when it's really hard to find something to be thankful for, remember, number one, that God loves you. And I challenge you this week as you enter and you prepare your meals and you celebrate Thanksgiving, that you write down the things that you are grateful for. Stick them in your Bible. And on those bad days, pull out to remind ourselves that even though in those bad times, those challenging times, the times we're struggling, the times when we are dealing with illnesses or the illnesses of others, that there's many, many great things that are in our lives. So that's my challenge to you this week, is to remember that God loves you. And that And as you're enjoying that Thanksgiving meal, and, and Isaac, what's your favorite Thanksgiving food? Pumpkin pie. Pumpkin pie. Now, I don't like pumpkin pie or pecan pie. I'm one of those weird things. I like things like, you know, lemon meringue pie or something like that. But um, as you're eating that pumpkin pie, you remember that God loves you. Okay? Can we have a prayer? Dear Lord, thank you for this day, and thank you for the people that are gathered here. We thank you that even through the rough times, you have sustained us, you have loved us, and you have been there for us. May we remember to be thankful to you, and we also be willing to show you and to share the gifts that God has given us with others. We ask these in your name. Amen. 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 Well, Scripture this morning comes from the book of Genesis, chapter 6, verses 1 through 9. And I'll be reading from the message. When the human race began to increase with more and more daughters being born, the sons of God noticed that the daughters of men were beautiful, and they looked them over and picked out wives for themselves. Then God said, I'm not going to breathe life into men and women endlessly. Eventually, they are going to die. And from now on, they can expect a lifespan of 120 years. This was back in the days when there were giants in the land. The giants came from the union of the sons of God and the daughters of men. These were the mighty men of ancient lore and the famous ones. But God saw that human evil was out of control. People thought evil imagined evil, evil, evil from morning until night. God was sorry that he had made the human race in the first place. It broke his heart. And God said, I will get rid of my, my ruined creation. Make a clean sweep. People, animals, snakes, bugs, birds, the works. I am sorry that I made them. But Noah was different. God liked what he saw in Noah. And this is the story of Noah. Noah was a good man, a man of integrity in his community. Noah walked with God. The word of God for the people of God. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, open our hearts to hearing your word. That as we hear your word and leave this place, that we put it into action. That we become doers of your word. Sharing you with those that we need. It's in your name. Amen.
this Sunday will be one of the last Sundays, of course, that we look at heroes from Scripture. And this morning, I have picked Noah. Noah, of course, we know from building the what? The ark. There was a story of a pastor who attended Hillsong Church, which is a big mega church in Melbourne, Australia. And he was there with his daughter and son-in-law. And they were seated in the third row back. And the music that they listened to was awesome. They were talking, or they were singing about God's beauty and his passionate expressions of, of love to all of those that had joined. It was over a thousand folks. The pastor spoke of this vision that he had for Hillsong Church, staring everyone to do greater things. And then the pastor writes, all of a sudden, I felt so small, so insignificant. Yes, I was still very much a part of God's church, but a very small part, just a face in the crowd. And for me, it was a strange feeling. Excitement for what God is doing, but a, but a sense of the insignificance of my part in this great plan. And that's the way we can often feel. When we begin talking about heroes of faith. And we try and we wonder, how can we ever measure up? How can we ever contribute anything to God's plan? But if you think about it, over the last few weeks, the heroes that we have talked about have been these just insignificant, original folk. Some may refer to them as just good old country folk. But that was before God put his call upon them. It's not the person that, it make, that makes them a hero. It's how to respond to God's call that makes the difference. We saw Paul, who was an ordinary fisherman, who he dropped everything, left his people to follow Jesus only to deny him a short time later. But he ended up being the foundation on which God built his church. Sarah, the, who was long, or excuse me, who was, it was way past her childbearing years, but she gave birth to a child that ended up, her and Abram were the beginners of, of a nation that would become God's chosen people. So today, I want to look at this, this ordinary, insignificant person of Noah, who lived in the desert. You know, as a child, we, we learned the story of Noah, or of Noah, that he built this big ship and brought two of every animal, every creature on. But today I want to look at him a little different. I want to look at his story a little different. To give you just a little, a little prelim. You know, God's children were in, it was in turmoil. Cain had killed his brother Abel, who, because he was jealous over Abel's gift to God, and he felt that God looked at his gift better, or thought that his gift was better than his own. Jacob, who delivered his, or deceived his blind father into giving him his brother's blessing and inheritance. And Esau, who then tries to hunt him down and kill him. Sin is everywhere. It's touched everybody. And the message is clear. That God has, what God has created has been destroyed by human sin and it's sunk to the level of beast in the wilderness. And then finally God said, enough is enough. I've had it. His heart was troubled. And God makes that 
painful decision to just wipe it all out. Start over again from scratch. Walter Bergerman writes, God is not angry, but grieved. He's not enraged, but he's sad. The depth of God's pain is revealed in, in the use of the Hebrew word, which is asaf, which means, or it was actually used to describe the pain of childbirth. This is the depth and the magnitude that God was feeling, of pain that God was feeling. He sees, and the decision he knows that he has to make. But there's a glimmer of hope. And this glimmer of hope he finds in Noah. Noah had found favor in the eyes of God. What can we learn from Noah about our life and our faith? First, heroes walk with God. Noah is a righteous man, blameless among the people of the time, and he walked faithfully with God. But why did God favor him? Three reasons. One, he was righteous. One of the things that the writers of Genesis want us to see is the difference between the sinful world in which Noah lived and then Noah himself. The Hebrew word for righteous, righteous is sadiq, which means to do justice and to be right within a relationship. In other words, Noah believed, excuse me, believed in God and he trusted God. And he lived his life as God planned it for him to live. Despite all the turmoil and all the mess that was going on around him. Second, we learn about Noah that he, he's blameless. He's one who lives out the commands of faith and is pleasing to God. And then third, Noah is described as one who walked with God. What a powerful image this is. And I think for me, I get this image of, of seeing Adam and Eve in the garden and being able to walk with God in the afternoon. To, to have that, that connection, that, that spiritual and physical closeness to God. I mean, who doesn't desire? Desire to have that. This gives or brings to mind this, this concept of fellowshipping with God, talking with Him, living with Him, and dedicating our lives to Him. Paul puts it this way As a prisoner for the Lord, then I urge you to live a life. Worthy of the calling that you have received from him. The description of Noah is, is one of an all, all encompassing, all of those things touching every aspect of his life. This corresponds with this, with the ancient Jewish thought of or their understanding of worship, that worship wasn't limited to only the Sabbath. Instead, all of life was an opportunity to worship God through our, our actions and through our words. So every decision, every circumstance is an opportunity for us to, to do and to fulfill God's will. This isn't by chance. It's a deliberate effort of connecting with God to be led by Him and by His Word. It's not having God as a part of your life. It's where God continues to guide us, where His, His presence is a part of our life, a part of our existence. It touches every fiber of us. And it forms the foundation on which we stand. It's a story about Pastor Murray, uh, Andrew Murray, who was a 
South African writer and pastor who one night was locked in his church and he was walking home. And as he was walking home down the streets of Cape Town, he was that, that kind of person who everybody knew. So everybody noticed him and spoke to him and he was treated with great respect. But then suddenly, out of nowhere, he just falls face down. Boom! Those who were watching were shocked. They ran to him. A policeman was the first one who got over there to him and, and helped him get up on his feet. And Pastor Murray was embarrassed. He was a little flustered. The officer looked at him and asked him, he said, Pastor Murray, what's wrong? You're going to have to tell me because I'm not going to let you go on or walk home. Pastor Murray hung his head and with all these people around and tears started running down his face and he looked at the officer and he said, for a moment there, I lost the consciousness of the presence of God. It showed, so shocked me that I lost my balance and I fell face down. Everyone, please forgive me. Heroes are honorable. They're blameless and they walk faithfully with God. God who guides their every step, their every thought. God is present in them and they are present with God. Second, heroes are obedient to God's will. And I know nowadays for some this word obedient is a difficult one. It's we hear it and we automatically start to fear a little bit, like we're going to be hemmed up or that we're, we're, we're bringing, bringing problems into our lives. But make no mistake about it. Every great hero in Scripture makes themselves obedient to the will of God. We see this with the instructions that Noah got to build the ark. They were very specific. God told Noah to build him a boat the size of a cruise ship. Now, what does a guy who lives in the desert know about building a boat? Something that he's never seen before. Still, Noah says, yes, Lord, and he builds the boat. In fact, two times in the story of Noah, further on in chapter 6, we hear that he did everything just as God commanded him to do. Third, her heroes have lives that are interrupted. And in this story, Noah's life is interrupted. I'm sure he must have been pretty comfortable at the time. He was settled in his ways. By the way, he was only 500 years old. And this wasn't something that you just come home from work and started doing, was working on this boat. It was something that he had to commit full time to, to focus only on building a boat. His life was totally disrupted. But heroes allow their lives to be interrupted if it's but from God's call. They're obedient to the opportunities that are presented to them and So think about it this morning is how is God calling you to obedience in your life? Where is God trying to get you to break out of your life and to step out in faith and to take a risk as part of God's plan? God calls. Noah says yes. Now, he may have been doing some kicking and screaming, we don't know. But nonetheless, he says, yes. His comfortable life and his comfortable existence have been flipped upside down. For some of us, change is a four-letter word. We fear it. We resist it. But it shouldn't be feared. It should be welcomed. The trouble is we don't like change because we're creatures of habit. 
We, we like routine. We like control. We, we have our, our own ways of thinking and doing. And we like those just fine. Tony Morgan writes, I like comfort. I live life the way I like. And what's crazy is, God doesn't want me to be comfortable. Ecclesiastes 7 says, don't long for the good old days. This isn't wise. When you get right down to it, our natural tendency is to, to drift, which makes us comfortable. That's why we get bent out of shape when someone challenges our thinking, when, when someone challenges what we do. Our personal preferences are sacred. It's like, I like specific songs played a certain way. I like to listen at them at a certain volume. And lately it's a little louder because I can't hear too well. I like my ministries and their activities done a certain way at a certain time during the week at a certain time. I like particular teachings, teachings about scripture and passages that address sins that are, that are belong to certain people, not to me. New things make me uncomfortable. New things remind me or require me to give up control. New things make me change. New things force me to become a new person. Then he writes, I want to have new influence without giving up my old ways. I want to reach new people without giving up old methods. I want to become a new person without giving up my old life. It feels more sacred and more holy to, to hold on to things the way they were. Is it sacred or is it familiar? Is it holy or is it comfortable? Sometimes I have to embrace change because God wants to change me. The story of Noah teaches us when something we know and love ends, it's the beginning of something new. What if we could learn to see life changes or, or, or their interruptions as an opportunity rather than a threat? Heroes embrace God's call, which is often a ch to change and to promote change. Fourth, heroes are in it for the long haul. Scripture says that Noah was 600 years old when the flood came. Scholars believe it took him over 100 years to build a boat, which of course, man, he started it when he was 500. We don't remember Noah's story because of what he wanted to see happen. We remember it because of what he did. This man stepped out into faith. He, he went to work. And he went to work to get her done. Now there's one thing that, for, or, and then that one thing for many, many folk, may be, those, may be the most difficult thing a hero does. Galatians 6 says, let us not become weary in doing good, but the, for at the proper time we will reap a harvest if we do not give up. For as long as it took Noah to build the ark, every day he got up. Every day he continued to build. Imagine the number of times he just wanted to say, man, the heck with this. Roll back over and go back to sleep. To take it easy. To take a break. Do you think that 
that midway through he ever wanted to say, man, I've done my time. Let somebody else step, step up and take over. The task may have seemed overwhelming at times. But despite all of that, Noah was committed to the long haul. Noah was an ordinary guy saving the world one nail, one board at a time. It's hard to live a Christian life. But we have to be set and ready to go be there for the long haul. That's what makes a person a hero. To fail forward. To overcome the reluctance. To open themselves up to God's transforming work within them. To, to make a change. To, to enlist the help of others. To make a difference. To share God with those in our world who don't know him. Of the heroes, folks, we talked about over the last several weeks. They were not afraid to make a change. They were not afraid to fail or to fail forward. They were in it for the long haul. They were ready to put in the work. They were really, really to make a difference. And it's in his name. Amen. Amen. Please stay. As you leave this place and go out for the week, have a very merry, blessed Thanksgiving. Look for those things that you are thankful for and share them with those that you will be with. And as you leave this place today, hear the cries of those in need. Go into God's world, enabled by Christ to be in ministries of compassion for all of God's people. Love this world as God has loved you. And care always for all the creatures that he's given us. Go and faithfully serve in the name of our Lord who walks with you and loves you. Amen. Amen. Amen.